Hi, my name is Omer, and this is an outrage. Uh, it was an outrage 100 years ago when it was presented um, in several locations around the world. Marcel Duchamp actually caused sort of a stir in, in the art world when he presented it for the first time. Cubism was kind of new in the way that it presented several instances at one frame, in one canvas, to depict motion. Some other reasons this was uh, really absurd to people was because of the title, Nude Descending Staircase. Uh, I'm going to, that's other people's business, not mine right now. Um, you may think, what is a stir in the art world? Uh, but try to remember your rage whenever you see an image and realize that it has been photoshopped. Like, we have our differences, but we all know this image is wrong, right? Uh, this is less cubism, more cubisant. Um, uh, the, this is actually not photoshopped at all. This, this is shot using a technique called slit scan. I'm going to talk about it a bit, so hold tight. We're used to thinking about cameras as images that capture our entire field of vision, you know, all the X and all the Y, into one plane at one time. Slitscan works a little differently. Uh, if you look at the image on the top right, uh, you can see what a normal camera sees, or what you think a normal camera sees. Uh, and if you look at the bottom, you can see what a slitscan technique camera sees. The reason you see the entire image is blue is because it's only capturing when the blue line is passing that point and capturing onto the screen. There's some kind of compromise in this because we're, we're giving up our recognition of the object in order to see its motion or some other thing that, that we gather from it. And I, I find that it's, it's a fair compromise because we all know what a propeller looks like. So I think this is a good generalization of what photography is, right? I mean, we're giving up something, but we're not losing any information. In fact, the new image has the exact same amount of information. It just gives us more insight. And I think that's also a great generalization of what visual art is. Let's scan is being used a lot in a lot of techniques. I'm not going to talk a lot about it because most of you know this. Um, but you will notice that the top left image is uh, actually not slit scan. This is how an iPhone sees the world. The poor guy just wanted to take a shot of a propeller. And while the shot was being taken, something awful happened and reality changed. So uh, <laughs> while, the, while the image was being output from the sensor onto the memory, the propeller decided to move. And this happened. And this is a great thing about how we perceive reality and how our devices perceive reality. And there's actually no better place to notice that than a place in which you are corrupting people's uh, senses and essentially manipulating how they feel. I was a video editor, which is exactly that role. And video editors have a lot of power over media. You know, we're not limited to the same uh, sort of capacities that photography is. We're not even we're not even bound to the arrow of time. We can actually pause, and we can move back, and we can move forward, and we can rewind fast and slow. This is a great affordance that we tend to forget as video editors. And it didn't occur to me until I started studying math that actually editing video is just moving a bunch of images through a volume. We're used to thinking about linearly, but it's a volume. You know, It's an intersecting plane inside this stack of images that we just move around. So I started thinking about it, and I realized, if it's a plane, and if we're using it as a volume, why can we not view it in a different intersecting plane? Why does it have to be straight? I can, for example, want to see the building before it collapsed, but also the smoke in the same image. And this is, this is an affordance we have right now with like modern technology. Um, I, I may want to see the building uh, while it's still intact, and the smoke rising from the bottom. This is an impossibility the way that we perceive reality, but it's, you know, it's out there. Um, so I built this tool in my uh, third week of researching for thesis. Uh, and I find it a really useful tool, because this way I can find out, for example, where an actor is entering and leaving a scene. It's really cool to me as, as a video editor. But I had to move on at the point that I finished it, because it was the third week, and spending 10 weeks optimizing a tool is not the best way to end art school. Uh, so, so I had to move on. What I discovered, though, is that um, this, I'm having a lot of fun with this. You know, it's like this, this, is, this is a really nice interaction. And I wanted to pack that fun and ship it to someone else. And if, apparently, if you do a reverse lookup in the dictionary for the word fun interaction in computer, you end up with computer games. Um, so I tried building a video game that exploits the mechanic of slit scan and rebuild it in a way that people can have fun with it and also create. So I started looking at games that have time as an affordance. Time is a mechanic in it. The most famous example, of course, is uh, Braid by Jonathan Blow. 
this game uses um, a sort of mechanic that I, I find really cool. It's, it's exactly the tape metaphor. You have a videotape, you have a recording head, and the, play, the avatar in the game is bound to that recording head, and it's moving forward and backward in time, but we, as the agents, experience it a different way. We see the entire motion of back and forth. We are the players with that mechanic. The, player, the, the avatar does not see that as soon as you move it back. All of the time that he just went through was, is erased, right? So I tried building that thing, but it's been done in 2D, so I need to build it in 3D, obviously. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a physics engine that it was sort of a test. You can just, uh, can take time and rewind it, and you can have other objects move through it while uh, other time is stopped. It's got all the basic mechanics that Braid has, and it has this, uh, this uh, tape deck metaphor. I can do all the things that I can do as a video editor with it, but also do it in 3D. Uh, and then I, I needed a tool to control um, how I was pulling objects from this 3D in order to create that slit scan effect. So with the same idea that I had with video, the stack of images uh, being cut in a correct way, I created this uh, small simulation plane. What I'm doing here essentially is every line represents a point where I would like a frame or a second, however you want to call it, that I would be recalling from. So I'm recalling a lot of, uh, a lot of points in time uh, with a certain reality in them, Let, let's say a scene. And it's really easy to do in the case of video, right? I mean, if I had a green pixel at one point and had a red pixel at another point, all I have to do is find some combination between them. When I'm doing this with geometry, suppose cubes or something else, there's no real defined thing that's supposed to happen at the end, right? I mean, like, the combination of these two cubes is not a thing. There's no mathematical definition for this. There was also another issue with this. When I started with images, it was in two dimensions. I then added another dimension for time. It's a full dimension. Uh, so I ended up with 3D. Here, I started out in 3D. These are already objects in space. And I added, I added another dimension as time, so I'm now in four dimensions. Oh shit. <laughs> and this was a problem, like these two problems together led to actually a situation where the solution is not defined, actually the problem is not defined. So I started looking for uh, places before the birth of pixels um, that dealt with four dimensions. Uh, one uh, extremely famous researcher in the four dimensional field uh, is Henri Poincaré. He's a, this is actually sounds really bad in my American accent. Let's just call him Harry Poincaré and deal with it later, right? Um, so he was, he was a great researcher in the, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Actually, a person who was a great fan of him in the art world was Marcel Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp in this painting, uh, six years after Poincaré had died, uh, tried to recreate um, shadows from four dimensions into three dimensions. Let's actually explain this in a two-dimensional way first. So if you shine a light onto a cube, and it hits that light after hitting the cube, hits a wall, you see the shadow of the cube in two dimensions, on a canvas or on a wall. If you do that for a four-dimensional shape, you're shining a volume through a four-dimensional shape. The volume is three-dimensional. That's how it ends up in space. So the result of that shadow is a three-dimensional shape. And that's what we can see here, but drawn in perspective, because some people can draw. And that's how I came up with the idea for Horizon. Horizon is a game that uses that mechanic to create geometry. It's a story of Elizabeth Killing. She's a physicist. She built a small simulator to explore the effects of time. I'm going to show a bit of the game recorded, because uh, playing it live seems like a really bad idea. She's stuck in her simulator. For some reason, something went wrong, and she's trying to get out. She knows that because time can distort in her simulator, so can light. So she set up a lot of beacons in tall places. If she can only reach them and measure the light, she will know how to find, uh, find her way out of the simulator. In this case, her only tool that's being used for her is something she developed, a little with my help, uh, called, <laughs> called the horizon. The horizon is a tool that allows her to pull out different points in time. She now saw, saw the I-beam fall, so she's going to take and find a place where it's in one side on the ground and in one side in the air. This is physics that's been recorded in the game exactly. Now she's just scrubbing through them until she finds the right position where one side of the I-beam touches the ground. This, is, this was real geometry up until a minute ago. It's been recorded, chopped up, and re-released as this thing. Uh, this this, this it seems about right, so she can climb. This, this is a staircase now, right? This used to be an I-beam a minute ago. Um, so yeah, she can climb this up. I'm going to save you a bit of the trouble here. Uh, 
Yeah, let's go. OK. And she climbed up. Uh, yeah. Uh, OK, so this, this actually, I, I find this a really cool mechanic because uh, you can do some stuff with uh, static objects in a static context, right? This was on, an object on the ground. Now it's uh, in the air as a staircase. There's another context that you can use it in. For example, if you need to reach that beacon, and uh, if you happen to be walking and two, uh, two balconies just fall off a building for you, you know, just er like an everyday thing, um, you can actually use them while, while you're a kinetic thing. You can still use them as, as a static thing. So for example, right now, she tries to create a, an elevator from these balconies. She just jumps, suspends herself in midair, because that's what the simulator does, and then finds a place where these things where these uh, X balconies uh, can form an elevator for her. And this, I, I find this a really cool technique because it's something that appeared in Braid, but it appeared in Braid as just a ground object with no, you know, with no density. This is now, this is like a sculpture garden. You can put yourself in it and you can mold reality to the way that you want to. In this case, she just managed to do this and reach the second beacon. A third affordance, which I kind of like that is kind of emergent from this, uh, from this world is the ability to change kinetic objects in a kinetic context. In this example, Elizabeth needs to reach a beacon that's inside a crate, but there's a large propeller along the way, like deadly wind farm trying to kill her. Uh, and the way she does that is by finding a simple place where she can just bend the object enough by using its different points in time, and then the object becomes less deadly to her. In this case, she bends the propeller this way, and the propeller keeps spinning after that. Let's see. And I, I really like this. The reason I like this technique, so, like this, this world so much, is because it allows the user to create different kind of, well, a different kind of geometry for himself or herself. That means that you know, the game is totally personalized in that way. My hope is that when the game ends, people, start built, people have built enough of this world that they don't ever want to leave. This is going to be sort of a persistent game where all of the geometry just, just remains the way it is, kind of like Minecraft. And I hope that people treat it as a sculpture garden. This, these are some people I should thank for this, but they're, they're, these are not all the people I should thank for this. Um, so yeah, thank you some people. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, yeah, and that's, I think that's, that's about it for this presentation. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot.